Okay, we're live. Um, welcome everyone. I'm, I'm Sharon Durkin, the chair of the Boston Ward 5 Democratic Committee. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, we uh, are so happy that you're here for this very important forum um, with the candidates sprinting towards the September um, 6th uh, primary election. Um, just a note, this is not a debate, as it is intended as a big picture conversation and discussion about our Commonwealth's current status and future prospects among candidates seeking to lead that future via the four statewide constitutional offices. This event will be divided into two one-hour sessions featuring a mix of offices. Each group will receive at least three open-ended questions related to the candidate's vision for the Commonwealth, as well as a lightning round with personal questions with a Massachusetts hook. We are not asking yes, no specific policy questions, but we do encourage you to speak about specific policy plans throughout the discussion. Should you need or want, closed captioning is available. Please click, click the co closed captioning button. Today, we are excited to be joined by moderator, the incomparable Callie Crossley. Callie is a Boston-based radio and TV host, commentator, and public speaker. Her Monday morning commentaries on GBH's morning edition tackle wide ranging subject matter. She appears on Beat the Press, examining local and national media coverage and hosts Basic Black, which focuses on current events concerning communities of color. She's a frequent commentator on television and radio, and we're so honored uh, to take that she's taking part in this forum, the second that she's partnered with us on. Um, take it away, Callie, thank you so much. Thanks, Sharon. Uh, just a little underscoring about the timing. There are two one-hour sessions, two groups divided in each. You've been randomly placed in those groups. And likewise, of the, the lineup of the questions and the order of the questioning has also been randomly selected. So we have um, tried to make it as, as uh, easy as possible so everybody gets a chance. We've calculated that in the end, uh, uh, each of you should have about 10 minutes total. Um, and we're not tracking you down to the second, but if we see you going on, I will cut you off so that everybody can make sure that they get their uh, full uh, 10 minutes. A reminder, this is Marathon to September and Beyond, Visions for the Future of the Commonwealth, Candidates for Governor, Lieutenant Governor, Auditor, and Secretary of the Commonwealth. So let's get started, group one. And this is, by the way, intentionally a big picture question forum but we need your answers to be anchored in specificity. Here we go. What is the most urgent challenge currently facing the Commonwealth? Adam Hines. Um, well, first of all, thank you for, for hosting us and, and, and convening us. And, and thanks for all of you for, for joining this conversation on, on a big set of issues, it sounds like, given, by, given the, the first one. Um, I'm Adam Hines, and I, I think most of you know, we've, we've got, talked a few times that I'm currently a state senator um, representing 52 municipalities and running for lieutenant governor. Um, you know, for me, the, the biggest issue right now, obviously, we need to get through the, the, the pandemic and, and focus on things like economic inequality and um, income inequality. To me, that's we see that I, I spent a, my afternoon on a talk about um, under, uh, overcoming achievement gaps in education. And it kept coming back to uh, disparities by race and disparities by income. And, uh, and I feel like the Commonwealth will not reach our potential until everyone reaches their potential. And so as we're working to, to frame our investments in, um, in everything from housing and transportation and the economy and education, it often comes back to how are we overcoming those gaps? And so um, that's at the forefront of my mind right now. Okay, Salem Mayor, Kim Driscoll, you're up next. Thank you, Callie. Thanks to the, the folks who are sponsoring this. Really appreciate it. You know, I think COVID response and recovery could be at the top of the list. I think the climate crisis could be. I chair the school committee here in Salem, so I know our public schools are hurting both educators and students. But my number one pick would be housing. Housing is so key to the social determinants of health. We know that if you don't have an accessible, uh, safe roof over your head, that there's so many other things you're lacking in. You can't possibly do well in school. You're usually food insecure. We have a severe housing gap, not just in greater Boston, but frankly, throughout the Commonwealth. And as I've traveled just about in every corner, housing affordability is key on folks' mind. I think it's not only, for me, a moral issue. Everyone should have access to a safe, accessible roof over their head. And as I mentioned, key to the social determinants of health. But I also think that we're not in a position for folks who are working to afford a roof over their head. 
When Massachusetts is in the top three of the most expensive states to live, it also affects our competitiveness. As a city like Salem, a gateway city, we used to be the affordable place. You could pour coffee and pour beer for a living and afford an apartment. That is no longer the case. And I really worry about both our short-term and long-term prospects to be able to do the things that we want to do in Massachusetts if we can't have people living here, both young adults who want to raise their families in the communities they grew up, the workforce needs that we meet, and older adults who want to age in place. It really uh, has a tremendous spectrum, and I think there's more that we can be doing to support the production of housing, to ensure that tenants' rights are protected as new housing is developed, and also to secure uh, housing at all levels, whether it's safe and supportive housing for our, our most vulnerable members of our community, our homeless population, folks who are struggling with substance use disorder, uh, working families, the missing middle, right? People who are working so much, but so much, they, they make so much where they can't afford a subsidy, but not so much they can afford a roof over their head. And as I mentioned, even market rate, folks who want to and are able to afford an apartment still can't find them or a home, even home ownership. There's just not enough inventory. We have a lot of work to do in that space. Okay, uh, State Senator Sonia Chang Diaz. Thanks, Kelly. Uh, and I want to uh, echo those before me who, you know, I want to start in the right place, which is gratitude to you and to Wars 4 and 5, Sharon, Jonathan. I've lost you guys in my Zoom tiles, but um, thank you to everyone from both of the work committees who, who've uh, organized this event to bring us together. Uh, single biggest issue facing us as a state, um, I will say, is, you know, that really cuts across all, all issue lanes is the fact that. Uh, how you experience, uh, whether it's you know COVID or housing uh, insecurity or uh, educational prospects, economic opportunity in this state, all of those things uh, you experience very differently in our state, depending on the zip code that you live in or the color of your skin or the amount of money in your or your parents' bank account. Uh, and that is what I would describe as the single biggest issue facing us as a state because it does cross across all of those issue lanes. Uh, and for the past 13 years uh, on Beacon Hill uh, as a state senator, proudly for uh, first, uh, you know, in my old district, Ward 5 and now Ward 4, uh, I've been fighting like hell uh, to tackle the biggest challenges uh, that we face as a state in terms of these disparities. And we have one big in many cases, right? We've won $1.5 billion in progressive education funding for our kids' schools. We've won major criminal justice reform, police accountability. Uh, so I've seen what is possible when we decide to do it, when we find our courage and our political will in Massachusetts. But I've also seen firsthand uh, that we just still have too many folks uh, in our government who are more concerned with holding on to their power rather than doing something with it. And that is why we still continue to have these massive gaps in our state, uh, in, you know, in housing, uh, in how climate change affects you. We have uh, more affordable housing units in flood zones in Massachusetts than any other state in the nation, right? Huge disparities in how the climate crisis is going to affect our state. Uh, and so that is a commitment for me as governor that is going to run through all of those issue lines is making sure that we are uh, closing those disparities. Okay, State Rep Tammy Gouveia. Yes, well, thank you so much, Callie. Thank you to the folks who organized this here. Thank you for everybody who's listening in. It's an honor and a privilege to join you all this evening. I'm State Representative Tammy Gouveia. For those of you who don't know me, I look forward to getting to know you over the course of the campaign. The biggest issue that I think is facing the state of Massachusetts is income inequality. And I believe that it is driven by the fact that we have not set the conditions and made investments to ensure an inclusive economy. We have so many folks who are blocked out of economic opportunity, educational opportunity, living in, in safe, affordable and humane housing, transportation justice because of discrimination, because of xenophobia, because of misogyny, so many families have been just completely locked out of um, our economy and being able to support their families. And a lot of that goes back to what kinds of economic policies have we passed in the state of Massachusetts? What kind of tax policies have we passed in the state of Massachusetts? And so I believe that it is time for us to make those investments in the conditions so that every person in our state 
can have a thriving wage, has work that provides dignity and meaning and the opportunity to flourish and to achieve their fullest potential. I believe that starts with making sure that we pass the fair share amendment, to make sure that we block the ballots question that will decimate um, those who are in the gig economy, making sure that we are investing and living up to the promise that we made uh, for equitable education funding and investing in childcare because there's no way that we can really get our economy fully back on track without investing in some of those fundamental infrastructure needs. And that also includes investing in our people and the mental health of our people. If we cannot get our economy fully sustaining uh, without investing in the mental health of, of so many of our residents all across the Commonwealth, whether you're talking about young people who are struggling to get through the day and get through their academics, you're talking about working moms who had to take time off of work to care for whether it's their children or aging parents while also trying to you know, maintain um, other economic opportunities, or you're talking about our elders who are so often isolated and um, left out of opportunities to connect uh, with other folks in, in the community. This we know was exacerbated by COVID-19, but all of these problems, quite honestly, folks, existed well before the pandemic hit. We know we had a childcare workforce issue. We know we weren't making the investments in our mental health care system that we needed to. We knew that we had these growing educational outcomes. The list goes on and on. And so these are the issues that I would love to tackle as the next Lieutenant Governor, forming working groups to address some of these critical issues, mental health, educational fund, education funding and child care, the climate crisis, making sure that we are putting economic and racial justice at the center of our response to the climate crisis and making sure that we are, of course, investing in affordable housing, but also getting to the root causes of so many of these intersecting environmental and social justice issues. So I look forward to hearing more of your questions and being in conversation about some of these big picture issues, but also getting down to the strategies and the tactics that will really help us solve so many of these complex problems by working collaboratively and bringing diverse voices and perspectives to the table. Attorney General Maura Healy. Well, thank you, Callie. It's great to be with you and wards four and five and all who are tuning in tonight. It's great to be with uh, my colleagues here who are running for office. Really important well, ideas, really this. important challenges. Um, I don't disagree with anything that's been said about what we need to do in this state and the housing pain is real. You know, I left private practice to become civil rights chief to try to combat issues around racial disparities that persist across all realms. We have got a lot of work to do. The challenges are great, but I believe here in Massachusetts, we have an opportunity to do something that no state has done before. And we have the people power, we have the human resources, the intellectual capital, the innovation. We have a can-do spirit. We've just got to bring it together. And right now, the existential threat right now facing our state, our world is climate. And so I put forward a plan, a specific plan uh, to address that. It's about revving up renewables, doubling wind, making offshore wind in Massachusetts the world, the country's capital, quadrupling storage, um, making sure that we are going big on solar, making sure that we have for the first time a cabinet chief who will sit as a climate chief and watch not just EEA where everything has been housed, but we'll make sure that we are driving a climate agenda and a clean energy agenda across all of our state agencies reporting directly to me on our progress. It means modernizing the Department of Public Utilities. It means putting people who have suffered far too long disproportionately, our BIPOC communities, our overburdened communities, putting them at the table on the Energy Siting Facilities Board, at the DPU, making sure that equity is the center of a climate agenda. I am excited about the opportunity because while we think about the investments that are possible, I think about as well what is possible for jobs, what is possible for lifting people up who have for far too long suffered in environmental injustice communities. And I think Massachusetts has the potential to create a climate corridor, the likes of which this country has never seen before. All of the innovation, the technology that is gonna power our clean energy future is being developed right now as we speak 
in Boston and in Cambridge. That should be harnessed for our good and the good and the well being and the health of our families and communities. That is something I'm really excited about. It certainly is a challenge. As I say, it's the existential threat to our world right now. But here in Massachusetts, with the right leadership, we've got an opportunity to do something amazing. Okay, thank you. Um, Adam Hines, uh, for whatever reason, when the dice is rolled, you come up one. <laughs> so, so you're the first one again in this next set of questions. Um, note that I'm asking for a singular, I recognize things are interconnected, but just, but just hear us here on this. What would be the most urgent challenge, therefore, in the next decade? Adam Hines, state rep. Okay. Um, you know, it's hard to it's hard to not focus on climate change. And um, in the Senate, we just passed uh, a major bill last week, and um, and it was deliberately focused on when you look at Massachusetts and so not the country and not the world, where our major drivers for emissions are. It lands in transportation, buildings, and electricity. And so um, I was proud that my bill to transition the the you know, private vehicles to electric vehicles by 2035 was, was included in the base bill. So essentially all new cars after that were bought in Massachusetts after 2035 must be electric um, if this were to move forward. And it includes a lot of rebates. We include $100 million in rebates to bring the affordability down. And this, we're talking 12 and a half years from now. And so we're um, of the view that the price will go down as well. And so we've seen evidence that the industry is moving in that direction already, GMC, so every Chevy in Massachusetts uh, would be electric and Cadillac and Pontiac. Um, that GMC also said by 2027, they'll have um, electric vehicles under $30,000 and then you can add rebates, federal and state, and then the used car market. And so you can, you can kind of see, um, we're, we have to make sure there's an equity lens when we're talking about the transition to green transportation. Um, but that was a big one. And, and that's just one. That's just one area where um, we we've, we've said we need to do better. Um, so I, I think being very clear on, on this uh, as a priority of mine, I've, I've also focused a lot on carbon sequestration and um, it, namely because my district probably has the most trees out of anybody um, in the legislature. We I focus on natural carbon sequestration and, and making sure that we're um, not only reducing our emissions, but pulling carbon out of the atmosphere. And so, um, you know, this is this is an urgent one that we cannot act quickly enough. We cannot put enough uh, resources towards this, and but we can be a leader. Um, I've tried to do that by making sure we're joining New York and, and, and accelerating our chain, our turn to electric vehicles and greening our transportation space. Okay, State Rep Tammy Gouveia. Great, well, thank you so much for this question. So I agree, I, I think, Climate change is the next thing that we really have to tackle, the most important for us over the next 10 years. I have spent uh, since 1995 working in the space of environmental justice and pivoted really easily uh, to the climate crisis when I first ran for state representative over three years ago. And in the state house, I have championed uh, some bills that made it into uh, are going through the legislative process, and one of which is the net zero stretch energy code to address buildings as a source of greenhouse gas emissions that made it into the roadmap bill and the administration is already moving on that. Admittedly, they are not moving nearly fast enough and they have not addressed the need to make sure that retrofits are a major investment that we need to make. Um, so in the budget that was uh, filed last, last week, I filed an amendment to create um, a fund, a trust fund for major retrofits to ensure that working families and those who are lower income strata have access to the funds to be able to retrofit their, their buildings and their place of, of residence. Uh, so it's not just those who are in the wealthier communities who have access to uh, you know, opportunities to borrow against their home to make some of these critical investments that are really needed. It's all hands on deck to address the climate crisis. And so continuing to make uh, opportunities for incentives as well as uh, passing policies at the state level to allow our local leaders, our municipalities uh, to pass ordinances and bylaws that require new construction and major innovation to be all electric. We know that there are a number of municipalities across the Commonwealth that want to make this change right now, but the state legislature is in the way there. And so I filed a bill to basically get the legislature out of the way so that our municipalities can lead on this issue. 
One of the things that we don't spend nearly enough time talking about, though, is also reducing our consumption of water and some other resources. It's great to move towards electrification. It's great to address uh, greenhouse gas emissions and decarbonizing our economy. But we also have to get serious about waste reduction as we're moving towards electrification uh, to meet our state's climate goals. So those are the, some of the things that I've done to lead. Uh, this is one of the issues that I am uh, the most passionate about and believe uh, that we need to really roll up our sleeves and get to work. It's why in partnership with uh, the governor, I want to work on creating a working group focused on the climate crisis and bringing diverse voices in so that we can really hear from those who are in our unions and those who are um, in the fossil fuel industry right now to make sure that the transition that we are moving down a path towards is a just one so that nobody is left behind as we make this critical pivot and this critical change uh, to the ways that we um, run our economy and, uh, you know, light our buildings and heat our homes and, um, you know, run our cars. So I believe climate change is the thing that we really have to tackle in the next 10 years. Thank you. Okay. State Senator Sonia Chang-Diaz. Thanks, Kelly. Takes me a minute to get to the mute button. So um, I know you're looking for one, but I have to just uh, I have to you know challenge the premise here, even though I know it's offered in good spirit. Because look, I have seen this pattern over and over and over again in the legislature over my past 13 years that uh, we say we you know uh, marginalized communities, communities of color, low income communities have to wait. We can't handle you know uh, addressing your concerns right now because we're doing this other big thing this year, and that's all we can do, right? And we can walk and chew gum at the same time in Massachusetts. We've got a lot of smart people here. We have no shortage of natural resources, technology, know-how. What we are limited by is political will, right? And so, yes, I would say, uh, as, as uh, colleagues before me have said, climate, uh, definitely holds not one of those top spots in the things that we have to tackle in the next decade. That's why I came out early in this race uh, with a Green New Deal plan for Massachusetts that lays out specific benchmarks um, for how we get uh, to be carbon free in Massachusetts um, before, uh, you know, faster and more urgently than our current benchmark of 2050. I'm delighted to see that the Attorney General has come out with a plan today that uh, mirrors many of the provisions that are in that plan. I hope we will have, you know, more time to talk more in depth about the, the you know, overlap and the contrast between our plans. But we cannot just pick one thing, right? Because while we might uh, make progress on climate, we cannot tell uh, communities of color to wait. Uh, for economic, for closing the racial wealth divide, for closing opportunity and achievement gaps in our schools. And, uh, you know, that is why I have also laid out a, a robust plan for education equity uh, in this state. I'm the only candidate in this race who has been out long and proud uh, in support of universal early education and care. Uh, who supports uh, debt-free public college uh, in Massachusetts, which are two humongous things that we can do um, to close those divides. And Kelly, uh, you know, back when we were debating uh, the Student Opportunity Act uh, in 2019, you know, when the debate was intense and uh, the chips were down and there were uh, three proposals that were being, you know, debated on Beacon Hill about what we should do with our K-12 education funding system. And there was a billion dollars on the line, Callie, uh, between uh, my proposal, the Promise Act, and uh, the two other proposals that were before the legislature. Uh, I was, I'm the only candidate in this race that was willing to stand up for low-income communities, for BIPOC communities, and say, this billion dollars of difference between these bills really matters. And one of these bills will get the job done. Uh, at actually tackling those get those divides, uh, and these other two won't. Uh, the attorney general was not willing uh, to make that distinction. She sent a broadly worded letter to the education committee that said, "You know, please uh, implement the recommendations of that bipartisan commission," uh, but not willing to actually stand on the line and say, "This is the job that will make the difference. This is the bill, rather, that will get the job done." Uh, for low-income communities and communities of color that have been waiting for years uh, for educational equity. 
Um, that's what we are going to need from our next governor when it comes to tackling these urgent priorities for the next decade. Because look, these things are not going to be easy to achieve, right? The status quo is the status quo for a reason. And it takes uh, grit and courage and political will um, to stand up even when it's politically costly uh, and politically uncomfortable uh, to drive change on Beacon Hill. And that is the through line of these issues, uh, of what it's going to take to get progress on these urgent issues for the next decade. Attorney General Maura Healy. Thank you. Um, I think that, you know, in, in particular, my, my comments on climate and my climate plan speak directly to some of what you're hearing from others tonight in terms of the needs for major, major advancements in, in consideration about how we deal with housing, how we deal with transportation. It's all in there and it's all important. I actually want to speak, though, to I think the broader issue, Callie, right now, over the next 10 years, is, is affordability, is affordability. Um, when you're talking about housing costs, childcare costs, healthcare costs, higher ed costs, which by the way, the legislature has only, you know, we, we've dropped funding over the years for, for higher ed, and we need to do more about that. The investments in early education and childcare. Um, and I know everybody on this, on this, Zoom uh, supports these things. It's just to say affordability right now, the number of families right now, and it breaks my heart, who are sleeping in cars tonight with kids, families who are on the edge, barely holding on before COVID, who've been pushed over, families who my, I, my office fought hard to fight off evictions and foreclosures. I've been doing that work you know, for years, and especially during this pandemic. You see it in real ways from employers who are, you know, um, concerned about the number of people who are leaving the state of Massachusetts to begin careers because it, it's unaffordable. It really, it, it's, it's a, it's, it affects a range of people and circumstances in the state. We've got to address that. And we've got to really look at what's happening with workforce development and how we are making sure that people, all people in this state have access to opportunity have access to economic mobility and economic prosperity. I think we've learned a lot through COVID. COVID only exacerbated disparities. It revealed to some um, who maybe didn't appreciate it <laughs> before the real disparities that are out there. And I think coming out of COVID, as we think about the investments that we're going to make, as we think about the ways that we can collaborate the things we can do. This is a time to build forward and address those disparities, to address real issues of affordability that will hold this great state back over the next 10 years. That's, that's I think, that's, that's something I wanted to, to drive home with folks tonight, even though I put out a climate plan today and I think it is really important. I really, you know, as I go around the state, um, these, are, these are the things that I think are top of mind for so many families right now. Uh, Salem Mayor Kim Driscoll. Thank you so much. This is one of those issues where maybe it's good to go last because uh, a lot has been said. And I think uh, if we're talking about the biggest issues that are going to impact us over a decade, you've really got to put the exclamation point on, on the climate crisis, climate change in particular. It doesn't feel like to me that in Massachusetts we have acted deep enough or quick enough with respect to what we're seeing. I say that as the mayor of a coastal community who sees rising seas right outside my window. Um, some of the things that are happening on the local level have actually been really more innovative. Um, we in the city of Salem have our own climate action plan. We worked on it actually in, in concert with the city of Beverly next door. And I think every community needs their own climate action plan. It helps you assess where your greenhouse gas emissions are coming from and then puts together a to-do list. And in our case, that includes policy shifts, behavioral shifts, and then working on mitigation and adaption strategies as well on the ground. I think it's important to remember this is another one of those issues where we're not gonna make progress on tackling the climate crisis and the impacts of the climate crisis without action at the local level. We were one of the early adopters as a green community here in Salem. We've done a tremendous amount of work, municipal aggregation, converting streetlights to LED, really working hard on energy efficiency and trying to bring that to beer. There is more work to do in that space. And it would be great if our utilities didn't have so much influence over what's happening with regard to green communities and some of the policies that we see at the statewide level. Some of the actions that we've taken at the local level and other communities have too, but we've been a real leader in this space. We wanna be a car optional or a car light city. That means we've invested in ride share. We have a Salem Skipper service 
operates on an Uber platform, started out as an age-friendly initiative, and really is serving all ages. Over 44,000 rides to date, that's 44,000 rides that are going in a shared ride service, reducing single occupancy vehicles. We've got a car share program where we've invested in. We buy cars, put them around neighborhoods. So when you need a short trip where you need your own vehicle or a vehicle, here's a low cost way to get around. And of course, bike shares and walking and thinking about the land use side of the policy in terms of 15 minute neighborhoods. We need to bring a resiliency lens to all that we do and certainly support the future of clean energy as a port, historic port in Salem, a place that frankly had a coal fired power plant, one of the filthy five, not that long ago, that now is home to a, a cleaner, more efficient natural gas facility with a permit that ends in 2050 and a bridge to a more renewable future with a new offshore wind hub on the horizon. Those are the steps, that's the statewide policy, the actions that we need to be taking in concert with local, locals to bring climate justice to bear. There's a reason that plant wasn't built in Manchester by the sea or on the Gold Coast. It was in our community. And frankly, people in 1950 were happy to have it. It meant jobs, it meant tax revenue. It left a whole lot behind. So as we think about the clean energy sector, I hope, I, um, excuse me, I hope we're also gonna be thinking about how the communities that have paid the price for some of the, the types of energy that we know leave behind, our, leave behind our remnants and are harmful are also at the forefront of getting that assistant, assistance. Um, in, in, in closing, I really think that as mayor, I can be a bridge to localities. Again, we're gonna need action at that local level. And we need to be thinking about the backwards mapping. You know, I'm somebody who has to operationalize plans every day. And I always say, plan the work, work the plan. We have passed important legislation. We have important benchmarks, but what's the backward planning that's actually gonna get us there? What's the blocking and tackling that's necessary? We have an outdated grid that needs major investments. We have a clean energy sector that is not going to happen here unless there's a strong public-private partnership. We have to put that agenda in place, make sure the workforce needs are there to support it. Tremendous upside, not only for historic ports like mine, for gateway cities across the Commonwealth. And it's not going to happen without intentionality and planning. I think that's work that I certainly hope to partner with our next governor to undertake. Uh, I think it's a huge opportunity for Massachusetts as we think about actually realizing the goals of the legislation that's been passed and doing the hard work. This shouldn't be government versus private sector. This is an opportunity for Team Massachusetts to come to bear and make sure we're addressing the impacts because there are some. If you're talking about a major energy shift, there are gonna be impacts. How do we pay for it? How do we get everybody on the same page? And how do we move that forward so we can hit those goals and those targets that we know are so vital to our future success? And you know, someday our grandkids are gonna ask us, what do we do about climate change? And right now we don't have good enough answers. We've got work to do. Okay. A uh, little time check. Um, most of you are right about where you should be. Um, State Rep Hines, you're running a little short. State Rep Gavea, you're running a little long. So with that said, um, starting with you, State Rep Gavea, on this uh, next question, and I'm just going to keep that in mind in case I have to shut you off a little early. Um, what does a finish line look like for each of the challenges that you've identified? And more importantly, or equally importantly, how do you muster consensus? to achieve these goals, to get it done? Go Great, ahead. wonderful, wonderful question. So I'm a doctor of public health and a social worker, and I have been a social worker for the last 25 years. And so throughout my career, I've brought people together to try to tackle some of our most pressing issues. So going back to 2007, 2008, I formed the Lowell Roundtable on Substance Abuse Prevention. So early in the opioid crisis, when people were looking at the issues around substance use disorder and addiction with stigma, with confusion, and with a lot of blame. And what we've come to now, you know, almost 20, 20 years later, is just a much different approach to that issue. I believe that's the same kind of skill set that I will bring to the Lieutenant Governor's office partnering and bringing in diverse voices, diverse perspectives, people with lived experience. I've been a single parent for 14 years. So I understand how difficult and how chaotic lives when you're living so close to the brink of economic ruin, how hard it really can be to get through the day, to keep food on your table, a roof over your head, and just get through the things that you need to do. But I wanna bring in people with lived experience who can really speak to what are the challenges they're facing with our transportation system? What are the challenges with their, they're facing with getting access to healthcare? It's why I support a Medicare for all system. What are the challenges that our folks are facing when it comes to accessing housing? 
What are the issues that folks are facing when it comes to securing reliable jobs that provide a dignified wage and dignified work conditions? So the finish line for all of the issues that we talked about here, I believe are making sure that we are investing in all of the conditions to support thriving local communities so that every resident has access to the resources that they need. And I believe that we can do that by really prioritizing the health, the well-being, and the dignity of every single resident in our state to make sure that we are making it easier for our working families to access the resources that we say are supposed to be available to them. I've experienced it as a single mom. I've seen it as a state representative, the numerous barriers that we put up to our working families and to our small businesses. And if we don't address those issues and really have an eye towards a much bigger, uh, more audacious vision for what our thriving neighborhoods really ought to look like, then we're not going to get there. So we have to we have to go big, uh, as they say, go big or go home. So I think there's uh, lots for us to do to make sure that everybody has access to those resources, so that everybody is able to reach their fullest potential and to you know go into retirement with dignity, to get through the day with dignity. I think we have uh, to, to leave it there, Rep. Sure, Rep. That's fine. Thank okay. You. All right, uh, State Rep. Adam Hines. <laughs> Okay, great. So I'll, I'll take the balance of that and, and apply it. Now, I, um, so I, if you remember, my first point was related to income inequality and the second was climate. And so the finish line, you know, for me, it's, it's really making sure that we, this isn't rocket science. We know that to, to address the, the challenges of, of you know, being one of the most expensive states, being one of the most unequal states, we're in the top 10, um, where we've seen that the gains from economic growth have gone disproportionately to the already well off. We know that to, to compensate, you invest heavily in healthcare, in housing, in childcare, uh, all of which strain our wages. And, and so I think that's the, that's the first part. It means being very clear about the, the fair share amendment and making sure that passes this year so we can make sure we're, um, we're, we're following up on our investments in the Student Opportunity Act and transportation, making it accessible. Um, look out here, you know, we feel far away from the Capitol, uh, making sure we have trains that are running into Boston, and making sure folks can travel around their own region. Um, and so those are some of the big ones, uh, including uh, affordability, free the T and free, free the RTAs. Um, I, I think it also means making sure that pre-K is universal and um, I would say free, but certainly affordable. And so Common Start is a big piece. And so you can see all these building blocks coming in to play. Um, again, I hosted a conversation today on equity and education where there was a, there was a, a lot of consensus that you need to have uh, opportunity to uh, closing gaps by a race on education attainment. So investing in early college, it's, it's showing such promising signs um, and yet we're barely scratching the surface when it comes to incorporating it fully in, in the Commonwealth um, debt-free higher ed. So you, know, you can see all these things. And, and I think the next question becomes, oh, well, how are you gonna pay for it? Well, I've already talked about a couple when it comes to fair share amendment. Um, I'm the chair of revenue in the Senate and I'm participating on something called the Tax Expenditure Review Commission as a result. And we've identified hundreds of millions of dollars that essentially go through uh, without any transparency whatsoever. Uh, many are out of date. Many are not applicable to our economy today. Uh, I've identified half a dozen where we could um, easily uh, raise well over $200 million. And, and so there are, there are plenty of ways that we can pay for these fundamentals. Um, in terms of building consensus, I spent about 10 years of my career working in the Middle East for the United Nations, involved in conflicts, negotiations in Iraq, Jerusalem, and Syria. So I've spent my career bringing people together, building consensus, taking on the big issues. Um, I, would, I would make the argument to the next governor um, that as lieutenant governor, I can help her promote a, a lot of these in progress by convening the cabinet, helping to um, lead the conversation in the Commonwealth. I've spent my entire career doing it. Okay, Attorney General Maura Healy. Oh, you're still muted. Apologies. This is what I've been about, you know, as attorney general running the people's law firm, it has been about team building. It has been about collaboration. We would not have been as successful if we didn't act and operate in that way. And I am so proud of the team in that office, the 600 folks who go to work there every day in four offices around the state who go with a particular thing in mind. One, there's an equity lens on everything we do, no matter what division you're working in. And two, 
We're going to get there through teamwork and collaboration. When I started as attorney general, I did something that hadn't been done before. I set up a whole council, councils so that regularly I could bring people in, meet people where they are on a variety of fronts. A council on new Americans, you know, to better address the needs of our immigrant and refugee communities. A council on race and equity, on labor, on disability. And that engagement, having an open line of communication in government is absolutely imperative to the success of government. Also, representation matters. I am proud of the work that I have done with my teams to diversify our office. We know that representation matters, seeing is believing. You know, look at what Katanji Browns Jackson's confirmation meant last week on so many levels. You know, and you can do this in government. You know, you can do this in government by putting people in place to succeed, by empowering them, by supporting them, and by having them harness what we've got here for tremendous resources in Massachusetts. You know, it's a special state and it's not a state without its problems. We have many problems, but I am optimistic about the ability of our next governor to come in and innovate, to collaborate, to team build, to set the vision. Because I know just part of my nature, you know, many of you know, I'm the oldest of five. Um, and I also was a, a team captain and a point guard my whole life. And there it's always been about the assist. It's been always about collaboration. And that's, that's what I think this, that's what the urgency of the times require. The challenges that we face are incredibly daunting, incredibly daunting. But I think they are huge opportunities for this state. When we realize the power of our people, when we, when we find ways to work together, when we meet challenges head on, and certainly I think I've had experience standing up to the most powerful interests in the world and being successful. I've also found ways to collaborate, and that's what we got to do in government. Okay, uh, Sam, Salem Mayor Kim Driscoll. Thanks so much for the for the question. And I think the earlier conversation that we had around housing, at least for me, that was the uh, the the a high uh, priority issue that I think our Commonwealth needs to deal with. And I, I think we really need to affirm that we recognize that everyone has a right to safe, affordable, and life enriching housing. That the production that we want housing production that meets the varied needs of the population that exists within the Commonwealth, and that we recognize that quality housing really also needs to exist where we have access to good jobs and transportation and choice and necessary community activities. When I think about housing in my mind, I think every city and town needs their own housing production plan. That was the light bulb that worked in our community to recognize when we say no to housing, when every single new project takes on sort of a hand to hand combat we're actually hurting the people who live in our communities. Good news, all of us are living longer, that's great, but we don't have enough housing to meet the growing demand of both, both folks who are living longer and young adults who wanna live in our community. So it's time for Massachusetts to adopt a pro-housing stance statewide. This is not just an issue that affects greater Boston. When you're out in the Western part of the state, you hear there as well from folks who are concerned about their ability to afford housing in the place where they live, even if the housing might be slightly less costly than what we're seeing in other regions. This is an initiative where we need to be clear. Market rate housing should be affordable to people who are earning average wages. How do we create that? How do we work together to both incentivize that happening in communities and work with people who are building housing to make that possible? We also need housing for lower income households, folks who require special accommodations. We have extremely long lists of all of our housing authorities, both for seniors who, who haven't saved enough or outliving their savings, and for folks who are vulnerable for an, an array of needs that have long lists and frankly, public housing that also needs to be invested in. Housing that should be safe and healthy and resilient. We are one of the, the, the places that has the most amount of public housing that's under threat. There are innovations happening right now. I see it in my own community at the local level where we're working with our housing authority in concert with the state to look at where we have public housing, rebuild it, work with private nonprofit housing partners, to address not only the existing public housing need, but increase it and enhance it, building places where people can live and in a more resilient way. We also need to recognize that housing needs to be part of a complete neighborhood. We don't wanna build housing in places where you don't have access to robust transportation and, and jobs in retail and civic and open spaces. Our communities look a lot more like Europe when you think about it. 
We're not quite as old as they are, but where we have operations, our gateway cities, often many of which have rail and access to transportation, many of which have been economic hubs. How do we think about really partnering in a way that says each city and town has their own housing production plan? We work to incentivize the creation of housing in those locations. We have a statewide campaign that recognizes the dignity of housing that everyone should be entitled to. And then we leverage the, both the technical know-how and assistance of our private sector and our public nonprofits. Let's face it, cities don't build housing. The state doesn't build housing. We need to get people around the table who build housing, understand what the challenges are, and they are many. The cost of the dirt, right? Acquisition of land. It's not any cheaper depending on if you're building market rate or affordable housing. Land is expensive. The cost of building the housing, supplies, construction costs, labor, all going up. We need to put the best minds around the table and understand what more can we do. In my community, we're looking at leveraging public land. We've looked at building housing on our high school campus that could serve our teachers, our paraprofessionals, our custodians, people we want in our communities. I think there is innovation happening combined with education and a real thoughtful, robust policy from the state that says we want housing built. I'm super curious to see what happens with housing choice. We've got some incentives and in communities that have access to rail. Are we going to embrace that or are we going to need to have a, you know, more of a carrot or more of a stick to try and ensure that we're going to have the housing that meets our demands? Not doing so risks our competitiveness as a commonwealth and certainly puts us in a position of being a place that's going to continue to see a homeless population increase. And I don't think anybody, anybody wants to see that happening. Lots of work to do, but certainly more we're capable of. Okay. Um, State Senator Sonia Chang Diaz. Thanks, Kelly. Um, and I just want to refresh. The question was about how do we define success? What does it look like when the job is done? Let, let me repeat it. What does the finish line look for for each of the challenges that you articulated? And how will you muster consensus to achieve the goals that you've set? Yeah, OK, such a great and meaty question. Um, I think uh, in order to answer both of those questions, I want to I want to pick up on uh, something that the attorney general talked about. Um, which was the advisory councils that she's established, um, which I'm glad she did, right? That's a really important uh, first step uh, of bringing people to the table. Uh, but the thing is, is that's not, that's not what the finish line looks like when it comes to, and, and, and also not how do you, uh, it's not what it looks like to do the full job of coalition building in order to get the job done. Um, because, you know, even though the attorney general has that racial equity uh, uh, advisory council. She did not consult with that racial equity advisory council before partnering with the governor on uh, a proposal to expand, uh, significantly expand police surveillance powers uh, in our state. That's a major issue uh, to communities of color and a major issue uh, of racial justice consideration. People of good faith can disagree about that, but if you're really about, you know, centering equity and bringing people into the fold of coalition building, um, you got to ask them about the meaty stuff, right? And, and, and not just the, the easy decisions. Um, what it looks like to me when you, uh, you know, what does a finish line look like on some of the things that I talked about? Uh, you know, it looks like kindergartners not coming into their first day of kindergarten with a multi million dollar gap in their word exposure um, that they have already accumulated from their tenderest years. Uh, as little learners in our state. It looks like uh, little, little uh, you know, I'd say little Franklin Chang Diaz's, right? My dad came to this country with 50 bucks in his pocket uh, and a one-way ticket from Costa Rica. He went on to become our nation's first Latino astronaut. And that was because he had access to, uh, you know, educators who weren't so spread thin that they could see him uh, and invest in him and a, pub a public college system uh, that was accessible to him, that was price accessible to him. Success to me looks like making sure that there, you know, this next generation of Franklin Chang Diaz's around our state continue to have access to that, that, that ladder uh, into success, into full contribution into our economy and our society. It looks like on the issue of climate change, uh, fewer cars on our roads. It looks like electrified, yes, but also expanded uh, mass transit, public transit uh, infrastructure so that we are marshalling all of our residents, um, not just those who can afford cars, to the work of uh, reducing our admissions in the transportation sector. It looks like rooftop solar on every roof in Massachusetts that has appropriate sun exposure. And it looks like a big ownership stake 
for entrepreneurs of color uh, in this new industry, in these new green energy industries that we're going to create with this transition. But I will say, Callie, that this is we're just scratching the surface here, right? There's so many other issues that it is important for us to um, define clearly exactly how do we define success. Uh, and picture the, the finish line and how are we gonna build the coalitions to get there? These issues are important and voters deserve to have them fully discussed and debated in this race to see where the candidates stand. And that's why I have challenged my colleague in this race, the attorney general to three debates before the democratic convention in June. And as much as I appreciate this conversation here today, Callie and uh, the members of these work committees, I think it is important to acknowledge that this is not a replacement for debates. So, uh, you know, Maura, I just want to say to you, you know, candidate to candidate, person to person, I think we both acknowledge that debates are the cornerstone of our democracy. Um, that's why you challenged your uh, primary opponent in 2014 uh, to debates before the convention. And we can agree that voters deserve to know where we stand on all of these issues and how we define success on these issues. We've already received offers from NBC Boston and WGBH to host debates before the convention. So I wanna ask you tonight, right now, will you agree to participate in these debates with me for the good of the people of Massachusetts? Kelly, I don't wanna take your, this is your forum, so. I, it's not up to you, would you care to answer? I'm, I'm happy to, well, I'm happy to answer. I don't wanna cut into others' time. Um, it is great to be on tonight. I look forward, we actually have a debate next week, gubernatorial candidates. I look forward to that. And I look forward to continuing to talk about policy um, over the next six weeks as we head into Worcester. And uh, we've already committed to, to debates following the convention. So look forward to more of that. And I don't wanna take up time of, of other candidates who are here tonight uh, to engage and, and talk to voters. Okay, moving on. Um, Adam Hines, you're up again. <laughs> How do you want people to understand the role of the state government as a vehicle for the changes you envision? How do I want people to understand it, you said, or how do I understand How do you it? want people to understand the role of, the, of state government as a vehicle for the changes that you envision? Well, I have to say, as a, as a state legislator, you, you feel very close to communities and, and to the ground in terms of when people uh, have see a problem, when they see a major challenge that we confront as a commonwealth, as a society, um, that government feels and looks accessible, right? And you have to participate. And so when I was um, starting in the legislature, we've, we've tried to continue, although it, it disappeared a little bit during COVID, um, making sure that there are regular opportunities for town halls and, and people to engage very closely in, in either putting their own ideas for solutions and um, but then also being aware of how we're communicating. So I think, uh, you know, to the legislature and the executive branch. So for me, I, I feel like it has to be as proximate as possible. I think it means not only um, kind of transparency in government, but also um, what are we doing to make sure that some of the COVID era um, shifts in access maintain? So trans, uh, providing testimony from anywhere in the Commonwealth. Um, when you're in a far corner like I am, you, you often are asking this constituents to drive four or five hours round trip for a three minute testimony. And that just isn't good for democracy. Um, and so I think that's a, a key one and making sure that um, we have, you know, clarity on, on um, you know, everything from committee votes and um, across the board and, and making sure that piece is clear. And so uh, to me, it's really about the, the Lieutenant Governor's role as well has um, become more and more about that liaison with communities. I would certainly hope to continue that. Um, I love that uh, a lot of people in my district have my cell phone. I will make sure everyone in Massachusetts has my cell phone as Lieutenant Governor. Um, and I'm not even joking. And, uh, and I do think that that's a, a key piece when, when someone can pick up the phone and cut through the red tape, um, that, that proximity is, is really vital for me. And so um, I look forward to, to doing that as Lieutenant Governor. Okay. Um, Tammy Kavir, same question. Thank, thank you so much for this question. So one of the things that's really, I think, uh, big for us to have on the table here is our democracy and making sure that it is as strong as possible. And fundamental to that is making sure that every person in our in the Commonwealth can access the ballot box and uh, show up to vote. Um, but it also means that people in the Commonwealth, every single resident, should have the trust of our government officials. 
And we know that we've had major challenges in navigating through the COVID-19 pandemic. As a doctor of public health, I was raising the alarm bells uh, really early on in 2020 saying, what are we going to do about COVID-19? It's coming, we need to be prepared. And then we saw from the Baker Polito administration just half truths and not a lot of direct uh, communication to the people of the Commonwealth so that they could take measures to protect themselves, their families and their communities. Whether you're talking about access to the vaccine or you're talking about the need for us to partner with manufacturers uh, of rapid tests to make sure that everybody had access to those resources. Instead, what we got was a privatized response that put many of these life-saving tools, the vaccine, information, rapid tests, access to PPEs, out of reach for so many of our BIPOC and low income and immigrant families all across the Commonwealth. So you need a Lieutenant Governor who has done the work of building relationships, building trust. It's why I got in this, in this race back in June of 2021 to crisscross the state to start to build those relationships so that we can get to the work of rolling up our sleeves and working together to recreate trust in our Commonwealth, to recreate trust in our systems because they're simply not working for everybody. And I hear from people across the Commonwealth just how hard it is to get a therapist for their 13 year old who has co-occurring uh, autism as well as a mental health disorder or hearing from families who are taking care of fragile uh, children who have medical needs that are not able to get access to the nursing care that they need. These are moms and dads who are so stressed out taking care of their very fragile um, children and are not getting the support that the state is supposed to be investing in and providing to them. So it comes down to trust and I've done that throughout my career and we'll continue to do that and we'll do that as your next Lieutenant Governor. Okay. Um, Salem Mayor Kim Driscoll. Alan, would you mind just repeating the question? I want to make sure I've sure. heard it accurately. How do you want people to understand the role of state government as a vehicle to get the changes that you envision? Yeah, thank you for that. You know, I feel fortunate to be a local leader. Uh, I'm proud to be part of what I call a get stuff done wing of government, where people just expect action. I've been reelected to my fifth term. I've been in local government for 16 years. And I really do feel like it's the branch of government that people rely on the most. We're educating your kids. We're keeping your neighborhood safe. We're investing in those places where you make memories, whether it's a downtown square or your favorite beach or park. And it builds up a lot of trust and a lot of accountability. You know, there's no hiding in a job like mine because you it's neighbors, it's friends, it's family. It's every single day working to improve the place that you live. And I really think that lends that sense of urgency, that commitment, um, the ability to have a meaningful impact on the places that we live. That's an important quality to bring to the state house. Um, I'm grateful for the work that I've done. I really see myself as in, in, in the role of Lieutenant Governor as an opportunity to be a strong partner, um, a strategic partner for our cities and towns, working with our next governor to make sure people understand the value of state government for them. And I think COVID has taught us a lot. In many ways, it, show, it has shown us the future. Um, there's opportunities for us to enhance the way we communicate with individuals in our Commonwealth. We pivoted on a dime with so many things. The fact that we're having this very important forum right now, all sitting in our respective own communities and able to communicate with 125 people. None of us have driven anywhere. None of us had to move anywhere. Here's a perfect example of the access to government that's been opened up with one technology solved for folks who have it. Um, we've seen you know, a 750% increase in people participating in attending meetings. You don't have to have a babysitter. You don't have to come down to a city hall for a public hearing. You can weigh in. You can do laundry while attending a meeting. All the things that people love about this technology. But how do we make sure more people have access to it? So breaking down, you know, uh, breaking down the barriers that exist uh, in terms of digital equity. Some of that's ensuring that people have access uh, to broadband. Some of that's the digital literacy, the tool to use it, and then the hardware itself. I think there's investments that we can make for people to understand how these federal resources, we have an amazing opportunity with these federal dollars, historic amounts of resources. What are we gonna spend it on in a way that's gonna ensure we have some economic, longer term economic prosperity, that we're closing gaps and that people feel like these dollars that we're invested, that we're entrusted with investing are actually improving their quality of life, improving outcomes for them. Those are the challenges before us. For those of us who are lucky enough to be in government, asking people when we ask for their vote, for their trust and their wallet, and ensuring that they know we care about them and I wanna put those dollars to good use. 
That's the work that I do every single day. Frankly, you don't get reelected in local office unless you're delivering for folks that they understand even when they disagree with you that you've got the best interest of your community at heart. I hope that that is the same way that we can work at the state level, forming partnerships, aligned visions. We're not gonna agree on everything. Even those of us who are all Democrats on this forum don't agree on everything. But how do we craft a unified vision, work in concert, the executive branch, the legislative branch, local government with public partnerships, with private sector, with nonprofits. We've got amazing brain power in this Commonwealth and all kinds of opportunities and a chance to really realize that. Our Commonwealth, a number of our communities in our state will be hitting 400, a quadricentennial over the course of the next decade. Let's use that as a milestone. What, what's the expectations for kids starting kindergarten or hopefully pre-K uh, as we hit, hit those milestones? What's the expectations for somebody graduating a high school, a public high school in Massachusetts? Mayor, Mayor Driscoll, we're going to have to leave it there. <laughs> you All can right. tell I'm excited about it, Callie. Yeah, I can tell. Um, uh, State Senator uh, Sonia Chang Diaz. So, Kelly, I too love this question um, because it, it, you know, it's core to what brought me uh, to run for office in the first place and what brought me into this race, right? I see uh, so clearly the way, you know, the load that working families are carrying in this state. Uh, you know, housing prices that are going through the roof, as, as Mayor Driscoll has uh, talked so well about, uh, you know, some of the worst traffic congestion in the nation, the fastest growing student debt load, you know, healthcare costs, which we haven't even been able to talk about tonight, uh, childcare costs, which we have a little bit, the consequences of climate change and state government is a huge lever. It's not the only tool, but it's a huge lever uh, for tackling each of these problems and not just nibbling around the edges, but really tackling them at scale. Um, but you know what I've seen also over and over again over my time in office is the way that Beacon Hill tells working families to wait. You know, wait another year, wait another uh, you know legislative session. Uh, wait until we tackle this other problem to get around to, uh, you know, people of color and marginalized communities. Uh, it's too much waiting. It's too much waiting. And, you know, we can do better, right? And I say that not as an article of faith. Um, I, I know it is true that we can do better than this in Massachusetts because uh, I've lived it, right? I've seen this kind of transformational change happen before in our state. You can see it in the things that I have helped build and deliver over the past 13 years, you know, to your point in the last question about how do you build coalitions, right? You can see it, and this is, gets back to, the, you know, how I want people to see state government. It is a big lever for solving these problems. It is also not something that is, you know, divorced uh, and separate from you and me and all the rest of us, right? It is us and it needs us, right? And you can see the potential of that in the coalition of urban and suburban parents, students, workers, researchers, business leaders that we brought together to win the Student Opportunity Act and that $1.5 billion in annual progressive education funding. You can see it in the outside in organizing that made true criminal justice reform possible in 2018 and in the police accountability law that protesters called us to in 2020. You can see it in Massachusetts historic transgender equal rights law um, that was a beautiful coalition of stakeholders that pushed Beacon Hill to tackle that and get it done. The problem is, Callie, these kinds of wins, while they show us what is possible, they are still the exception rather than the rule. And I, you know, I don't know about you guys, but I am tired of it being the exception. We have to make audacious problem solving like that the rule in Massachusetts so that we can deliver universal early education and care and debt-free public college in our state so that we can pass a Green New Deal and you know, green our energy use and build a 21st century transit system. These things are within reach for us. All but right, we're we gonna have to leave it there. Stay there. Right. <laughs> okay, <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> Attorney General Mara Healy. Oh, the role of state government, you know, the role of state government, there is such possibility in this time right now. Sure, it's about being accessible. It's about being representative. It's about having open lines of communication. And it is about making sure that we are acting with an urgency that we've never acted with before. The role of state government, there's so many things we can incent. There's so many things that we can leverage. There's so many things that we can lead on. State government's got to do that. State government has got to work in partnership with local officials, with others in the, the nonprofit sector, in our business community, in our grassroots communities. I mean, 
that's the possibility of state government. People need to believe in state government though. You know, we work, we work for the people of this state and it is our job, all of us are in elected office. And I know all of us approach our jobs with a commitment to trying every day to make life better, to create more opportunity for everybody in this state, regardless of their zip, zip code, their race, their religion, their sexual orientation, their gender identity, I could go on. That's state government is there. And I will say, Callie, I'm, I'm struck by a couple of things. People have probably heard me talk a lot lately, speaking out about the efforts by some governors to cut off access to safe legal abortion and to just demonize our poor trans kids and our LGBTQ community members. And I have spoken out with a vehemence that's born of my life experience, but also born of the fact that I led so many of these fights in my time that I was privileged to serve in the attorney general's office and be attorney general. And state government also represents the values of a commonwealth. And in this time, we have an opportunity to say something about our Massachusetts values and to stand up in the face of those who would seek to marginalize or make vulnerable or demonize or weaponize hate there's no place for that here in Massachusetts. And I wanna be a governor who's really clear about that. And finally, Kelly, I'm reminded, I'm reminded I stood in my office in Ashburton. This was a few years ago. I had just left, meet, I was meeting with a mother who'd been separated from her daughter at the border and my office filed a lawsuit. We went to file a lawsuit as we did time and time again to stop bad things from happening by the Trump administration. And we filed a lawsuit to, to stop families be, from being separated at the border, but she was terrified. She was removed from her girl and didn't know if she was ever gonna see her again, an eight-year-old who was taken from her on her birthday. And I just held that woman in my arms and I happened to be looking over and I was looking over at the, across at the, at the state house and I, and I just held her. And I don't know, the, the words that came to me at that time were, don't worry about what's going on in Washington or else I want you to know in Massachusetts, we're your government too. We're your government too. And to me, that's what leadership is about. That's what state government is about. And that's what all of us who are putting our names forward to do something that is challenging. I know we all believe in that. And I hope we have an opportunity to be that government for the people of the Commonwealth. All right, it's a great transition to, I know we're running a little late, but we wanted to squeeze in a lightning round. By that, I mean a few words, a word or a sentence. A few word, words, a word or a sentence. So first up, and Mara, you're um, talking now, so we're just gonna pick it up right here. It's possible that next year, Massachusetts might have Democrats in the corner office for the first time in almost a decade. What is the one policy that becomes possible that wasn't possible before? <laughs> we're gonna get a lot, guaranteed to get a lot of great things done working together, I can, I can tell you that. One. That's a guarantee. You got one? Too many, you Kelly. One? Do you All see right. our list of things that we wanna All do? Right. We want okay, to be ready to right. go day one. That's, that's what everybody should be excited about, the specter of, of Democrats. Well, moving on, got it. All right, favorite Massachusetts park or green space? More Healy. Me? Um, probably favorite Massachusetts park or space? Mm, probably, uh, I have to say probably Cranes Beach. That's a trustee's property. Um, okay. I. I have to say, uh, maybe spending a lot of time in Concord and Lexington, you know, <laughs> lately. Right. Well, that's good. I have to Finally, say out there. I'm trying to get it all in. Favorite Massachusetts museum? Museum? Whew. How can you do this, Callie? This is I mean, words four and five. I'm okay. <laughs> I, I, I think that the, I think the MFA. Okay. Very good. All right. Uh, Salem Mayor Kim Driscoll. First time in the corner office, one policy that becomes possible that wasn't possible before. Every four-year-old in a high quality pre-K, like they do in Alabama and so many other places, biggest okay. investment we can make. All right, uh, favorite Massachusetts park or green space? Easy one, we've got so many to choose from in Salem, but Winter Island, if you can't find me in my office, I am hiding in Winter Island or in All right. favorite enjoying a moment. Massachusetts today. Museum. Another easy one for me. PBD Essex Museum, the PEM, <laughs> if you haven't been here, you're missing out. Okay, very good. Uh, Adam Hines, one policy that becomes possible that wasn't possible before. I agree. Universal pre-K, um, affordable pre-K for everyone. 
Okay. F uh, favorite Massachusetts park or green space? I've got to go with the tallest mountain in the Commonwealth. It happens to be in my district, Mount Greylock. All right. Favorite mu Massachusetts museum? Turns out that's also in my district, Mass <laughs> Okay. All right. Tammy Gurea, uh, one policy that is possible that would not be possible before, potentially. Really transformative, bold climate policies. Okay. Favorite park or green space? Maudsley State Park. A favorite Massachusetts museum? Lowell Textile Museum, my hometown of Lowell. Okay, state rep Sonia Chain Diaz, one policy that becomes possible. You're... <laughs> uh, I'm gonna divert here and say, uh, while I agree uh, with some of my colleagues about universal early education and care, I think if we actually got that to the governor's desk under a Republican administration, that that governor would sign it because it would be impossible politically not to. So I'm gonna say, um, driver's licenses uh, for all Massachusetts residents, regardless of immigration status. And I'm gonna say here again, I'm the only candidate in this race who was in support of that. Uh, One word, okay. Favorite uh, Massachusetts park or green space? Uh, I'm gonna go with the Southwest Corridor Trail where I spent a lot of hours with my kids during the pandemic. Okay, favorite Massachusetts museum? Uh, this is a tough one. Uh, if you'd asked me a week ago, I would have said the gardener, but now uh, I got to say the ICA. If you guys saw the article about the ICA uh, a day or two ago in the Globe, phenomenal okay. civic engagement commitment coming out of the, the ICA. Thank you all so very much. Um, this is my thanks from uh, for engaging in this uh, very intentional big picture conversation. And uh, I'm sure all of the people listening appreciate it very much. Jonathan, you're up next. Thanks, Callie. Oh. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Sure. Bye. Be well, everybody. Take care. Take care. Jonathan? Sorry, I was waiting to spell it in. For people to know, we're still going. So this is not wrapping up. We are starting our second hour. I'm seeing the folks drop off. Thank you. Uh, just wanted to say a few words while we transition to bring up our next crop of crop of candidates. Thank you again to the candidates in the first, um, Jonathan Cohn, chair of the Boston Ward 4 Democratic Committee. Thank you again to the five candidates who joined us in the first hour and our amazing moderator, Callie Crossley. I just wanted to note quickly that kind of the Ward's four and five Democratic committees are kind of committed to year round civic engagement. As we'll drop in the chat, Ward 4 meets the Third, the third Tuesday of every month at 6 p.m., Ward 5, same night at 7. We'll drop information about the chat. And then also in the interest of civic engagement, the two, our two committees will be doing a signature collection event outside News Feed Cafe at the Boston Public Library this Saturday afternoon at 3 p.m. Uh, if you like a candidate that you've seen tonight, or if you don't like them, you should still sign for them because it's important to make sure that everybody gets on the ballot. Uh, so I'll, I will note that in the chat as well. That'll, but that'll be this Saturday at 3 p.m. And, and take it away, Callie. All right, group two, sorry for the delay, um, but we're so happy to have all of you with us. Just a reminder that this is a big picture conversation intentionally, but we would like your answers to be anchored in specificity. Um, we have randomized the order of questions um, as well. So just so you know that, so I'm glancing at my list to make sure that I, we, keep the randomization going as we go through the evening. So we're starting with you, Chris Dempsey, um, transportation advocate. Given the ongoing and increasing gridlock and governance on the national level, what opportunities do you see for leadership on the state level? We'd like some concrete examples. Thanks so much, Callie. Give me a sense of how long we should calibrate the responses here. Are they 30 seconds, two minutes? Two minutes is about right. Just so you know, there's about, uh, for all of us in this hour, it's about 10 minutes a piece. Each of you, we're keeping track. We see any of you going over, we'll let you know, I'll cut you off. Well, thanks so much, Callie. And I just wanna start by thanking you for all of the contributions that you make, Callie, to our civic conversations. This is one of, of many, and I'm a huge admirer of yours in all the different ways that you push us to be better as a Commonwealth. Um, through you. your news reporting and your commentary. So it's an honor to be at this forum tonight. Um, Massachusetts has been a leader 
in so many areas, but we have fallen behind on everything from transportation to racial equality. Um, you're not going to find someone who is more proud of being from Massachusetts and having chosen to live here. Um, probably the the most for me, the, the moment of greatest pride is when I was in Central Square in Cambridge in May of 2004, where I got to witness marriage equality for the first time in the United States um, at the stroke of midnight as the first um, gay and lesbian couples walked out of Cambridge City Hall at that event. It was an opportunity to see the expansion of civil rights in real time, not in the history books, but to actually witness it firsthand. And we need to get back to being a state where we are pushing boundaries just like that. Um, and so there's there's so much that we can do. And I think the role of the auditor's office can help. What the auditor's office does fundamentally is shine a gap between where we say we want to be as a state, the laws that we've passed, the regulations that we've passed, and where we actually are. We shine a light on that difference and we tell a story about how things need to change within state government. Um, I've been a part of those conversations before. I have led those conversations before, as you said, Callie, on transportation, uh, leading the No Boston Olympics effort, which had particular impact on wards four and five, um, and where many of you were our co-leaders and, and supporters in that effort. Um, and there's there's so much we can do as a Commonwealth. So um, I hope that's a that's a kind of broad answer to the to the broad question. Um, we need to have that leadership back on Beacon Hill. We need to have Democrats elected for all of the constitutional offices. Uh, and I will just say that that alone is not enough because I remember joining the Patrick administration in the early days um, and being about 23 or 24 years old after working on the campaign and thinking that because we finally had a Democratic governor and a Democratic legislature, that all of a sudden all of our problems are going to be solved and we'd fix everything in the first six months of the Patrick administration and then we just had kind of hang out for the next three and a half years. That's not the case. United uh, government or own party is not enough. We need people who are pushing the envelope and pushing the boundaries and I want to do that as state auditor. Thank you. Okay. Uh, businessman Brett Barrow, same question. Yeah, thank you very much, Kelly. I appreciate the opportunity to be with you guys here today and appreciate you putting this event on. So let me say the thing that I would see is this one that is where Massachusetts already shines, but there's still so much more room to go. And that's education. As the product of first generation college students with a wife who's an occupational therapist and one of the Metro West school teachers, and as somebody who has had extensive experience as a member of Babson College faculty in the classroom, I think we can do so much more there in applying the lessons learned from the COVID pandemic on the education model. First, we have to recognize that education is an investment. It's not an expense. We shouldn't be thinking of it as something that we have tax dollars for that we should try to get them, get by with the minimum. We should think about how do we invest in making this worthwhile going forward. And when we talk about education, to be really clear, we need to be talking about education almost from birth all the way through all of your life. So whether it's pre-K, whether it's K through 12, whether it's vocational high school, whether it's community colleges uh, and their four-year colleges, education is a lifelong pass and we need to be more innovative on it. 50% of all of our teachers are thinking about leaving the field because they're burned out from COVID and frankly, they're tired with dealing with school committees and parents on both sides of the aisle fighting over COVID policy and a whole host of others, whether it's critical race theory or any of the other topics. And on top of that, when you look fundamentally at the fact that when we went into COVID, it came very unequally impact on our educational school districts. Some districts don't have good broadband access, and that limits their ability to learn from home. Others just don't have the resources for the teachers, and it's hard to provide uh, support remotely. So I think Massachusetts can be more innovative and work to figure out what are the lessons learned from COVID and begin to apply those so that Massachusetts remains the leader in the education field, not only because it's what our workforce competes on, but also because for each one of us individually, as for me, it leads to a better life. Thanks. Okay. State Senator Diana DiZaglio. 
Thanks so much, Callie. Would you mind repeating the question? I did not hear you when you first asked it. <laughs> oh, sorry. Given the ongoing and increasing gridlock and in governance on the national level, what opportunities do you see for leadership on the state level? And give us some concrete examples. Concrete example of uh, ways that we could uh, supersede what's going on in Washington and, and um, make sure that we end gridlock here at the state government level, I think, focusing on transparency and accountability. It's a bipartisan issue that I believe all residents in Massachusetts, Massachusetts care about, regardless of party affiliation. The folks that I talk to that live in all of the communities that I currently represent and across the Commonwealth uh, on my travels have repeatedly brought up the fact to me that they feel like they've been disenfranchised by state government, that they don't know what's actually going on in their state government. Uh, bills are voted on with little time for review. Folks don't feel like they have access to what's happening behind the closed doors up on Beacon Hill. Uh, we're not subject to public records laws. Uh, we're not subject to open meeting laws. Committee votes are not made public. That is a, a bipartisan issue. That's something that I think we could come together here in Massachusetts on both Democrats and Republicans and make sure that we are making it a consistent concerted effort to make state government more transparent and more accountable. We just need to take the time to actually focus on that. Uh, Massachusetts, unfortunately, for as forward thinking as we are and as much as we do set an example on so many uh, various topics on everything from climate change uh, to uh, you know, making sure that we have invested in our DEI goals, to making sure we have early education and care, we have, we're investing in our public education, higher education system. We do have some work to do when it comes to transparency and accountability regarding our state government. We're actually ranked as the least transparent and least accountable uh, regarding accessibility state government in the entire nation by almost every single good government group. So we have work to do, uh, and that's something that I think that if we focused on it, uh, that we can all agree, uh, again, across the board, from the most conservative to the most progressive, that we can give folks a seat at the table to be able to share their opinions, uh, to voice their concerns, have access to what's going on on Beacon Hill, but we are going to make a consistent concerted effort on that. And the role of a state auditor can uh, make some tremendous changes regarding transparency and accountability by helping to open up the process on Beacon Hill and across state government to everybody, regardless of our family background, our bank balance, or our zip code. And that's what I would bring to the Office of State Auditor. Okay. Uh, state Senator Eric Lesser. Thanks so much uh, for having me, Callie, and uh, I appreciate the opportunity to speak with everyone tonight. Uh, this question actually speaks to me in a, in a very real way because of my background and what brought me to state government in the first place. Um, I first got started uh, in politics really um, working for President Obama. My big break for him was carrying all of his suitcases around New Hampshire during the first in the nation primary. Uh, I ultimately traveled with him to 30, 47 states, excuse me, in six countries and worked about 30 feet from the Oval Office as the assistant to David Axelrod. Uh, I later worked for the President's Council of Economic Advisors. Uh, when I was there, I was there for the passage of the Affordable Care Act. I worked closely with Elizabeth Warren and her senior team on the passage of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. I uh, was there for the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell. Uh, I met LeBron James. I met the starting lineup of the Red Sox when I was there. Uh, there was definitely a lot of perks to working in D.C., working at the White House. Uh, but I chose to come home uh, and work in state government. I chose to come home uh, to Western Massachusetts and raise my family in the town I grew up in, in part because President Obama told me to. Uh, he said that if you wanted to see change in your communities, to grab a clipboard and go home and run. And frankly, I was also kind of fed up with the trench warfare, the game show mentality in Washington. What I like about state government uh, is that the, you know, the decisions are in front of us every day and you have to work collaboratively. Our state you know, is not that big at the end of the day. I, I appreciate that having to drive most of the distance of it uh, back and forth to the state house. And we've got to work together and we've got to work collaboratively. And I think the single biggest things I would really tackle and focus on as Lieutenant Governor is transportation, housing, especially as it's connected to transportation and the overall cost of life here in Massachusetts. I think we're all very proud of our progressive reputation. Uh, I was actually also at, in Central Square, Chris, back in 2004. I don't know if we ran into each other when we were there or not, uh, but we have a lot to be proud of in our state. But the reality of it is, is it's getting very, very hard to live here. 
So I'm going to be focused on making real progress, on connecting our state by high-speed rail, on building more housing and getting costs down, getting rents down, uh, and also doing what we can to lift all of our communities, especially ones that have been left out of the high-tech and the life sciences boom. We've seen benefits certain zip codes in our state. Uh, so I really appreciate the question, Kai, because it really speaks to what I've been all about in my career, uh, which is getting to home communities, uh, getting into state government where the rubber meets the road and working collaboratively across different people, different communities, different geographies to get big things done. Okay. Um, head of the Boston-based NAACP branch, Tanisha Sullivan. Thank you, Callie, and thank you, uh, Wards 4 and 5, uh, for convening us tonight. The fact of the matter is our democracy is in crisis. And at a time of such uh, ingrained uh, democratic uncertainty, it is critically important that Massachusetts be a leader in our democracy, a beacon for the rest of the nation to follow. The Secretary of State is the Chief Elections Officer for the Commonwealth. And the fact of the matter is Massachusetts is woefully behind on the protection and advancement of voting rights. Today, our legislature continues to debate some very basic threshold voting rights reforms like same day voter registration, which by the way, we are a half century behind in adopting. Maine adopted, close to a half century, Maine adopted same day voter registration in 1973. We are still working uh, to ensure that voters in Massachusetts have access to uh, permanent vote by mail, a flexibility that is available in Georgia, Arizona, and Florida. We are woefully behind, and Massachusetts voters are bearing the brunt of that lag, and our democracy is in peril as a result. I believe that it's cr critically important for the Secretary of State to be more than an office that is focused on simply the transactional nature of the job. The Secretary of State should be, must be, our Chief Democracy Officer, serving as a champion for the advancement of not only voting rights, but of our democracy. The Secretary of State is the Chief Information Officer. And as was already mentioned tonight, Massachusetts is one of the least transparent states in the country. We are behind, friends, and that is unacceptable. As Secretary of State, I will work to ensure that we not only make up the ground necessary to ensure that we have transparency and accountability in our government, but that, 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 but that the access to public information and public records is accessible to all of us, not just those of us who are deeply steeped in the political minutia, but everyday people, everyday people working in our communities every day to help create the types of communities that we all deserve. The Secretary of State is responsible. It is the gateway to business and industry in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Massachusetts is one of the most unequal states in the country when it comes to economic opportunity. I believe that the Secretary of State has an important role to play as a chief democracy officer, as a gateway to economic opportunity, and helping to ensure that our small businesses have access to, are connected to, the resources they need in order to thrive. The bottom line is our democracy is in crisis. And Massachusetts is perfectly positioned to lead the rest of the country in demonstrating what a strong, vibrant, and expansive democracy can look like and feel like for all of us. I am deeply committed to ensuring that Massachusetts leads, and that is going to require us to transform this office from being one that is solely focused on transaction, administration, and bureaucracy, and to one that is deeply committed to advocacy and opportunity and ensuring that we are all, that we all understand our role in this democracy and are all truly benefiting from all of the opportunity that exists here in the Commonwealth. Okay. So Brent Barrow, specifically, how will you get to the finish line on these issues that you've cited and use your political capital to build consensus? Yeah, thanks, great question. So when I worked in town government, 
I work by the adage that if you want to go fast, by go, go by yourself. But if you want to go far, go with others. I believe that the way that you create lasting change is not to try to jam something into people, but to try to bring them along with you. So I think the first thing that you do is you go out to where they are and you listen to them. And you recognize that what not one size will fit all throughout the Commonwealth. Our Commonwealth has a lot of different differences throughout the, throughout the geography, whether you're on the Cape and you're running a seasonal business there, or whether you're running a high-tech business in Cambridge, or whether you're running a small manufacturing company in Orange, like I used to do. Each of the areas of the Commonwealth has distinct needs. And those needs are founded in that community. And the best way to understand what needs to be done is to go out and listen to the people in the communities. Our form of town government works really well because people come together and they talk about what the problems are and they debate them and they can agree on big issues. When I was in Carlisle, our education policy would be decided on a voice, a voice vote in about five minutes. And that was 80% of our budget. Sure, we'd debate where to put a stop sign for about three hours, but the debate on what needed to be done worked because we had worked it out ahead of time. And I believe that's critically important when we have a diverse community. And it's critically important for all members of that diverse community to have a seat at the table when policy is being discussed. So for me, I think the key focus that I would say there is you go out, you listen, you craft it with somebody, and then you're not doing it to them, you're doing it with them. And that's what leads to real change. It's only when we fall into the, I have to win and I have to be the star that we get into where it doesn't work. It works best when everybody can be willing to let others get the credit as long as the right policy goes forward. Um, State uh, Senator Eric Lesser. Well, thank you uh, for this question, Kelly. And I think this speaks directly to the work I've done uh, over the last 10 years in my public career. I would just say, look at the work uh, that I've done. Uh, and I think the way, I think my background uh, and the perspective I bring are going to make me uniquely suited to bring our regions and bring our communities together. Because Brett is right. It's about teamwork and it's about partnership. Uh, for people who not might be familiar with my neck of the woods, where I represent in the greater Springfield area, I represent some of the densest, most lowest income urban communities in our state. I also represent a town without a stoplight. I represent some of the most progressive communities in our state, and I represent multiple communities that twice uh, voted for Donald Trump. One thing that I found unites all of those communities, frankly, is a feeling that our state is becoming harder and harder to live in. Uh, and one of the things that I focused on in my career is on zeroing in on those things that we can work on in common purpose. So let me just give a couple of examples. The most significant housing policy that has been done in our state in 40 years, the reform of our zoning codes, which we did last year in the legislative session in 2021, came through the economic development bill that I shepherded through the Senate and managed the conference committee for on behalf of the Senate and finally got on to Governor Baker's desk. We worked across a ver wide variety of groups that on, on the surface have very little in common with each other. Progressive housing advocates, chambers of commerce, civil rights groups that were uh, very engaged on the history of restrictive zoning that we have in our state and our state's legacy around those restrictive zoning codes. And we got done what is the most significant reform to zoning in 40 years and has already unlocked hundreds of new housing units across the state. There was a project I was notified about in Arlington uh, just recently as one example, and it's going to unlock new transit oriented development. We're going to require every MBTA stop in our state, including all the commuter rail stops, more than 100 communities are included in this, are going to have to have multifamily zoning within walking distance of their transit. We got that done last year. One more example uh, I'll share is the work I've done around the Student Loan Borrower Bill of Rights. We got this signed again last year. Governor Baker initially vetoed our first attempt to do this. We ultimately went back 
we got him to sign it. I worked closely with the attorney general's office to get that done. It took six years. But as a result of that effort, we now have a new Chapter 93A protection for 800,000 student loan borrowers in our state. The office is up and running. The notices have gone out. The division of banks has issued the licenses to the servicers. And that is now up and running and is law in our state. People, borrowers now have new protections that they didn't have a year ago. Uh, because of that law. We did it by working in partnership with people. It, it's not on a tweet, you know, it's not on Facebook all the time, but it's about relationships. It's about building trust with different groups of people. And it's about thinking about how we bring different groups, different people, different regions together to work on common purpose. The last one I'll just leave you with is rail access, connecting Western Mass and Eastern Mass by rail will help Western Mass for obvious reasons. It's gonna, it's gonna connect us to the job market, the, the red hot economy in Boston. It also helps Boston because it provides an escape valve for those housing pressures. And it also cleans our air by taking thousands of cars off the road and reducing asthma rates. So it's about finding partnership and common purpose. And I think that's the work I've done uh, for the last eight years in the legislature. It's the work I learned from working alongside President Obama for four years. It's the work I want to do in partnership with our next governor. Tanisha Sullivan. I am now in my 20th year of uh, legal practice. And as was shared earlier, I have the honor of serving uh, as the volunteer president for the NAACP here in Boston. I have uh, been in rooms both uh, that are have floor to ceiling windows and I've been in the rooms that have no windows. Um, and in each circumstance, um, we have worked to tackle some of the toughest issues, societal issues facing the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, racial, economic, and social injustice. Uh, and we have been able to roll up our sleeves together um, to deliver on some meaningful progress. We've been able to deliver um, in the advancement of educational equity uh, here in Boston and also at the state level. Um, the Student Opportunity Act um, is reflective of some of our work. Certainly increases in um, teacher diversity and hopefully here in Boston uh, having an elected school committee um, will one day be realized for us. We've been able to deliver on policing reform, working alongside members of law enforcement. We've been able to increase the amount of funding and financial resources available to our small businesses to the tune of about $191 million for small businesses um, owned by veterans, women, and people of color. What I've learned um, through my work um, is how critically important it is for us to have strong communities and empowered people as the centerpiece of our democracy. I believe that the Secretary of State must be a chief democracy officer. And that requires the office to be transformed from one that is solely focused on the transactional paper pushing aspects of the job into an office that is deeply concerned about and working toward uh, st strengthening our communities and empowering people at the very grassroots level. I believe that this office must, as a chief democracy office, be pushed beyond four walls at Ashburton Place into our communities. I believe that this office must play an active role in ensuring that our public schools have access to the resources they need to have high quality civics education K-0 to 12, so that our young people can have an understanding of how our democracy operates, yes, but most importantly, their role in it. I believe that this office has to be an office that has sleeves rolled up, working alongside community members, helping us to build the type of democracy we all deserve. A strong democracy doesn't just happen. A strong democracy doesn't just happen by being a sideline player. It requires that we have leadership that understands the critical importance and role that everyday people play in advancing the policies, in supporting the initiatives that lead to a stronger, more vibrant and expansive democracy that works for all of us. 
I believe that that is an important aspect of the role of a Secretary of State, particularly in this moment when democracy is in crisis and our country is looking for leadership and Massachusetts is perfectly positioned to be that leader. Diana Desaglio. Thanks so much. Um, when I think about this, I think about the quote that I try to live by, try my best to live by, uh, which is uh, a Martin Luther King Jr. quote, as we press on for justice, be sure to move with dignity and discipline using only the weapon of love, the weapon of love. We talk often about, you know, fighting for the things that are important to our communities and, uh, and, 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 and battling for the, the values that, you know, are, are part of our shared value system and, and making sure that we, we continue the fight and the struggle. Um, and I just think about that quote, that as we press on for justice, be sure to use the weapon of love. Um, I think about that in my interactions with my colleagues in the legislature, with uh, my colleagues in the administration, with my colleagues in state government, with my colleagues at the municipal level. And over the course of the last 10 years, as I've been serving in the legislature, there have been some tough battles and there have been some tough love exchanges, so to speak, uh, in order to move important policy proposals forward. There have been agreements, there have been disagreements, but it, it is those conversations, those difficult conversations that actually allow us to make the progress that we need. And it's taught me lessons on how to be productive and still stand up for what's important to me uh, and get the job done. I have been known to uh, stand up to uh, speakers, the governor, <laughs> the, uh, the powers that be on Beacon Hill on behalf of transparency, accountability, and equity. And I will continue to do that as the next state auditor. But I think it's important that simultaneously while we're standing up and we are blowing the whistle on these important issues and shining a light on the dark areas of our state government that really need a light shined on them to expose where we have equity gaps and achievement gaps and all of these things. Um, I can say that the relationships with those same people uh, that you are you know, taking to task on, on important issues, that those relationships matter and that it's important that we are acting out of love uh, for our communities and to make sure that uh, we are uplifting the values of those who need us to uplift them the most. Uh, some examples, Tally, uh, look, I, I, I'm very well known for my non-disclosure bill. Um, uh, I was sexually harassed at the state house uh, during my time serving as a legislative aide many years ago. Uh, the former Speaker of the House required that I sign a taxpayer-funded non-disclosure agreement that was meant to silence me about that harassment. Uh, I later on became a state representative. I broke that non-disclosure agreement on the floor of the House of Representatives, not to attack or accuse anybody, but because I love people in our communities and our government workers, and I want to make sure that none of them are forced into silence the way that I was. I took that battle with me to the State Senate. And uh, you know, over the course of the last few years, we've been able to pass that bill to ban taxpayer-funded NDAs that silence victims of all types of harassment, discrimination, and abuse in state government using our tax dollars. We've been able to pass that bill unanimously in the state Senate. As state auditor, because we haven't been able to pass it entirely, uh, I do plan on conducting a full audit of all of our state agencies uh, to find out where these agreements are being abused and where our government workers might be silenced building coalitions though, we did get support in the state Senate. One other example, I was the chair of the small business committee in the state Senate last session. I worked alongside of the Black Economic Council of Massachusetts to uh, empower our supplier diversity office regarding our state contracting. Because what's happening is we have billions and billions and billions of dollars going on in state contracts, but only a very small percentage of those billions that we're spending are going to uh, minority owned businesses. GBH has done some great reporting on this. I encourage you all to check it out. But we recognize that on the Small Business Committee. We brought that tough conversation to the table and brought it to the floor of the state Senate. And I'm proud to say that we did pass legislation to address some of those inequities and some of those challenges through the work on that committee, working alongside of colleagues. However, I brought up time and time again in my run for state auditor, there's more work to be done. I'll be auditing 
all state agencies regarding diversity, equity, and inclusion goals, and making sure that we're shining a light on contracting and uplifting that message as state auditor. I see you trying to jump yeah. in there. Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'll give it to you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Chris Dempsey. Ali, I believe that you can learn a lot about how someone will govern based on how they can, can how they campaign. And we're proud to be running a grassroots campaign in every corner of this Commonwealth. We have over 1,500 individual contributors, which is by far the most in the race. Over 1,300 of those individual contributors are Massachusetts residents. And I'm running a grassroots campaign because it's the only kind of campaign that I know how to run. I learned well, as a campaign worker for Governor Deval Patrick and the Democratic coordinated campaign in 2006. And in that historic election, we elected only the second black governor in the history of the United States. And of course, the first in Massachusetts. That was a true grassroots campaign that started in living rooms and kitchens and went on to take the corner office and bring it back to the Democratic Party for the first time in over a decade. But I've also led other grassroots campaigns, including one that started in a living room in Ward 5 on Beacon Hill. Um, my friends and I were following the debate around the Boston 2024 Olympic bid. And we saw that the most powerful special interests and corporate interests in Massachusetts were working together behind closed doors to hatch this plan that would have required all of us as state taxpayers to cover 100% of Olympic cost overruns. That's sort of the macro view Let's look at the micro view. The plan that Boston 2024 put out required cutting down 70 to 100 full growth trees on Boston Common in order to build a beach volleyball venue to be used for two weeks for that sporting event. Those were the kind of choices and trade-offs that Boston 2024 was asking all of us to make with really complete disregard for public opinion, and I'm sure the opinions of many of you about whether you would like those trees to exist on Boston Common or not. We stood up and we got organized against that effort and we got outspent 1,500 to one, 1,500 to one. They spent $15 million. We spent less than $10,000 on our side. But we had two things going for us. Number one is we got organized. In fact, our very first public meeting was also in Ward 5 at the First Church on Marlborough Street. We had about 100 or 150 people show up. And I think some of you who are on this Zoom today were part of that crowd. So we got organized, we built that grassroots effort. And number two, we had the facts and the data on our side. Smith College professor Andrew Zimbalist was our guest at that first public meeting on Marlborough Street. And he had the facts and the data about the history of prior Olympic cities. And my takeaway from that successful grassroots effort is that when you put good data and information in front of the people of Massachusetts, we make smart decisions. And fundamentally, that is the job of the state auditor, to dig into the executive branch, to figure out what's working and what's not working and how things need to change, and then to put that information back in front of all of us so that we can build a stronger commonwealth together. That's the role of the state auditor. That's the job that I want to do for you. And I've shown, whether it's working inside of state government or outside of state government, that I can build strong and diverse coalitions that go up against the odds and go up against the most powerful people in Massachusetts, take them on and win so that we can have that stronger Commonwealth. That's why I'm running for state auditor. Okay. Um, all of you are running a little long, so I'm gonna ask you to just tighten it up a little bit as we move to this next question. How do you want people to understand the role of state government as a vehicle for the changes you envision? Um, Eric Lesser. Well, thank you so much, Carrie. Let me uh, answer that in two parts. First, uh, more specific to the role I'm running for Lieutenant Governor, because I know there's often a lot of questions uh, about the role of the Lieutenant Governor. I actually think that recent history has shown that the role can be transformational. Let me just give one example. Uh, back in 2009, uh, the Obama stimulus was passed in Washington. Record money was uh, being directed to Massachusetts. And Governor Patrick at the time turned to his lieutenant governor, Tim Murray, and said, let's work on expanding uh, Worcester-Boston uh, rail, rail service. And Tim Murray, of course, being the former mayor of Worcester and someone who was familiar with the various players, got to work on that proposal. There are now 14, as many as 14 trains a day going back and forth forth between Boston and Worcester. I don't know if people have been in Worcester recently. I was there today. 
the the city has really been transformed. And in the between the 2010 and 2020 census, Worcester and the Metro Worcester area saw more than 14% increase in its population. So uh, there is the potential for transformative impact, and it's connected to the the second piece, which is the the piece I think you were more directly asking about, Kai, which is how does state government play a role? Look, the core things that are keeping people up at night in our state, in our Commonwealth, uh, in the city of Boston, are the inadequacy of our transportation, the outdated way people get around, the, the, the shortfalls of the MBTA. It's the skyrocketing housing prices. State government and cities and towns do zoning and housing policy in a much more significant way, for example, than the federal government does. And it's job training and education and making sure we're creating those ladders of opportunity. I've committed to closing the wait list, for example, at our vocational schools uh, across our state as Lieutenant Governor. This is something we absolutely can do with a little bit of elbow grease and a little bit of focus. I know we've got a lot of issues, for example, at Madison Park in Boston. I've worked very closely with the vocational schools in Western Mass, including several with similar challenges to Madison Park. We just need focused attention on these issues, and we need someone at the level of a lieutenant governor to bring the various parties together, the different cabinet secretaries, the state and local officials, the, the various uh, nonprofit leaders around a common table working on these issues. Uh, so that's really what I'm committed to. I'm going to be focused on transportation, on housing and affordability, and I'm making sure we're creating those ladders of economic opportunity for everybody in our state. And I think a lieutenant governor is uniquely positioned to make progress on those goals. Okay. Brett Barrow, you're running a little short. You're shortchanging yourself, so you can expand a little bit in your in your answer to this question. Again, uh, how do you want how do you want people to understand the role of state government as a vehicle Thanks, for the changes you envision? I'm just trying to be tight because I think the audience likes shorter answers. So, look, <laughs> I see a coming economic storm. We have inflation at a 40-year high. We have rising interest rates, and global money center banks are predicting a recession in 2023. You go into any city or town in Massachusetts right now, and you still see boarded up storefronts. You know that there are businesses that have failed there. And entrepreneurship in small businesses, particularly for our forgotten towns and our gateway cities, are one of the greatest social goods that can exist because they hire locally, they buy from other local businesses, and they reinvest in the community. And yet we failed them during the pandemic. We responded very slowly to their needs. Now, okay, it was the first time in 100 years that we had a pandemic, so we didn't know how to respond. But what the citizens of Massachusetts needs to know is that we can have a rapid response, that we can work with businesses to keep them open and keep our people safe. I don't think it's a binary choice. I think we can have both at the same time. But we can only have that if we have had people that actually have an experience addressing that issue directly. And as somebody who was in a small business for 20 years in one of our forgotten towns, I know how very little help state government can provide. I know that during the pandemic, we did get money out to them and that was a necessary but not sufficient condition for success. We need to do more than that. We need to get out to them and listen to what are their needs. And when I say there, I'm not only talking about the small business leaders, I'm talking about the community leaders in the town, the selectmen, the, the finance committee, the people that work hard to make sure that their community not only survives, but thrives. And I want people to know that the role of the Lieutenant Governor is poorly defined in our state constitution, which is not a glitch, it's a feature. It allows the lieutenant governor to bring their skills and experience to the table. And that's why I believe that the best government is a government that's balanced, where we have skills and experiences that fit one another. Mora always talks about being the point guard on a basketball team where different people play different roles. Picking up on Tanisha's point from earlier, I believe that economic justice and economic equality comes from making sure that we're supporting our entrepreneurs and small businesses in those forgotten towns and gateway cities. And that is the role of the Lieutenant Governor. And it's a role that I can explicitly play because I've done it. 
I've invested not only in a business, but in building a new factory, bringing in new equipment, getting new clients. And I've had that experience for over 20 years. I teach at Babson College, the number one school for entrepreneurship in the world, which Massachusetts is incredibly fortunate to have. And so we have these tremendous resources we could bring to bear. I think what the public is looking for is leaders that don't sit in Beacon Hill and decide what we need, but come out to them and work with them to respond to the real problems that they have. Thanks. Okay, Diana DiZaglio, running a little long, so I'm gonna ask you to be a little shorter. Yes, sorry, we don't have time limits on the Senate floor, so we just go on and on and on. <laughs> I apologize. Um, thank you so much. Yes, role of state government. Um, and I'll speak specifically to the state auditor's role. Look, as a state senator, I've worked really hard to get funding back to the communities that I represent. I grew up in Methuen and Lawrence, uh, housing insecure, actually. I think about housing opportunities in the Commonwealth and how we're in the middle of a housing crisis right now. When I was growing up, uh, our circumstances and being housing insecure was due to my own personal family circumstances, but right now you have people working three and four jobs and multiple incomes coming in uh, with people still being housing insecure. That's completely unacceptable. So state government can play a tremendous role, especially through the state auditor's office, of auditing these different programs uh, to make sure that they're actually functioning the way that they're supposed to be functioning. We've done a great job of passing some pretty good legislation in recent years. We need to do better. We haven't done enough. Um, but on top of the legislating, what the state auditor's role can bring to the to the um, you know conversation around housing, for example, is making sure that we're auditing those CDBG grants, making sure we're auditing the ARPA funds that are going out, that they're being spent appropriately and making their way back to the families they're meant to serve, making sure that we're auditing the MassWorks program, for example, with these public-private partnerships and these developments that are going up. It's great to know that a project might have gotten built for a family in need that was $500,000. Uh, but once you find out that it might have been able to have been built for $300,000, the conversa conversation changes. Uh, you find out that that, you know, couple hundred thousand dollars could have been used to put another family into housing. So, you know, working on making sure that our families that are most in need get the services that they they deserve. Um, and the state auditor's role can play a tremendous, uh, state auditor can play a tremendous role in that. I'm rushing my words now, but uh, that's what I would seek to do is uh, work on issues such as that. And thanks for the opportunity to talk about it. Okay, Chris Dempsey, same to you. You can uh, tighten it up a little bit. Always good advice from me, Callie. You could just start every question with that from here on out. Look, state government is the single most important unit of government that we have in Massachusetts. Many of you may have seen a recent article in the Boston Globe uh, that pointed out that the city of Boston has very few tools to raise revenue for itself. It has very little flexibility on everything from zoning changes to liquor licenses. And I think that status quo needs to change. But the reality of today's status quo is that it is state government that not only sets the agenda for policy in Massachusetts, but literally defines what municipalities can and cannot do. So it's the single most important unit of government. And when we get things right as a state government, they have payoff for decades and decades and centuries ahead. I like to talk about a bridge that connects into Ward 5, the Longfellow Bridge. That bridge was actually commissioned by the Massachusetts General Court in 1898. And when they wrote the law that led to the funding of that bridge, they specifically wrote into the bill that they wanted to build the bridge wider than they thought it needed to be at first. And the reason why is that there was this newfangled technology called the subway. And they thought that maybe eventually it would make sense to send the subway across the Longfellow Bridge to connect to Cambridge. That was a decision that was made 125 years ago. And today, it is the reason why that the economy of Eastern Massachusetts is as bright as it is. And you can connect literally that decision to the fact that it was Cambridge, Massachusetts and the greater Boston area that helped solve the COVID crisis or at least address the COVID crisis with the Moderna vaccine that was developed in Kendall Square a direct result of a decision that state government made 125 years ago. And when you tell stories like that about the power of state government, I think people understand how essential it is, how important it is, and the impact that it can have on them today and on the future of their families for decades ahead. Okay, Tanisha Sullivan, shorter please. The Commonwealth of Massachusetts needs a Secretary of State who is committed to being a Chief Democracy Officer. And what that means is, as the Chief Elections Officer, 
um, that there is a deep commitment not only to ensuring that folks can register to vote, but that there's a deep commitment to solving um, the crisis we have with respect to voter participation. We need a chief democracy officer who as the chief information officer in the Commonwealth is not only concerned with the availability of public records, but also deeply committed to ensuring that each of us, everyday people in our communities every day, know how to use that information so that government isn't happening to us, but it is actually happening with and through us. We need a chief democracy officer who as the corporations, as the leader of the corporations division is not just there to push the paper to make sure that uh, businesses can register here in Massachusetts, but someone who is deeply committed to ensuring that if you register to do business in Massachusetts and you're a small business owner, you can be connected to the resources that exist to help ensure that you can thrive. The bottom line is we need a secretary of state who is committed to being a chief democracy officer which means that a Secretary of State who is committed to being a partner with our communities, and most importantly, a partner with our people. Um, and I believe that that is probably the most transformative thing that we could expect from the Secretary of State's office in this, in this, in this time. Okay. Um, so let's start this way. And uh, Chris, I'm gonna, Kick it off with you. Significant likelihood that in November's election will lead to a full democratic control of state government. That's all statewide constitutional offices, both chambers of the legislature. Uh, our hosts, wards four and, and five, want you to know they'd be delighted with this. But if this happens, what opportunities does this afford the Commonwealth? In other words, what becomes possible that was not otherwise possible? Chris Dempsey. Transit system that works and reaches new communities. All right. Um, Diana DiZaglio. More fully and appropriately funding our public education system. All right, Eric Lesser. It's making real uh, the progressive promise of our state, uh, which is fully connecting our state, connecting our regions, connecting our communities by high quality transportation. It's solving and finally having universal pre-K. Uh, these are achievable things and it's real progress towards universal health care, making sure every single person in our state is high quality, low cost health care that's accessible to them. Tanisha Sullivan having a more inclusive econ uh, commonwealth that really delivers on the promise of economic opportunity, racial justice, climate justice, and social justice for all of us. Brent Barrow. Somebody who dealt with both cancer and COVID personally in 21, it's moving to a healthcare system that's a single payer system with Medicare available for all. Okay. Now we have a lightning round of questions to ask you, but before I ask them, uh, Carol Lasky has, uh, an announcement. So Carol. Hi, everybody. And to all the candidates who are sharing your inspiration with us tonight, we're so grateful. Um, if you all like tonight's event, you'll love the second one that we have planned. We are going to be um, speaking with the three candidates who are running for Attorney General on Monday evening, May 23rd at 6.30. Um, we struck out, uh, we're, we're, we, we did wonderful, uh, uh, again, Kelly, your moderation tonight is just stellar. And we were um, thinking who would be just the most wonderful person to moderate uh, a conversation with the three AG candidates and um, Globe editorial columnist Renee Loth came to mind almost the exact time that she wrote an article in the Globe that I really would love to share with you because there's nothing better for inviting people to go to a, an event like this than what Renee wrote just about a month ago. She wrote, listen to Andrea Campbell 
whom many know for her inspiring race for Boston mayor, talk about how the Office of Attorney General has the unique power and tools to make sure every family has access to a decent education, healthcare, and a living wage. Here, Quentin Palfrey, the state's first chief of the AG's healthcare division, talk about what he learned from running the poverty lab at MIT or listen to Shannon Liss Reardon, who represented immigrant workers in a class action lawsuit alleging wage theft at Harvard Square pizza chain, talking about the importance of speaking up for the voiceless. So thank you, Renee, for these words. It's a great advertisement for our May 23rd event. There is a, a, an Eventbrite link set up. So maybe as soon as we end tonight, you can go and register for that one. And thank you all for being here this evening. Okay, lightning round. Favorite figure in Massachusetts history, Chris Dempsey. W.E.B. Du Bois. Okay, favorite Massachusetts weekend getaway. Um, I would I would say Cape Cod. Okay, very good. <laughs> Diane Desaglio. Favorite figure in Massachusetts history? She's a favorite figure in Massachusetts history of all time. My mom. <laughs> okay. Favorite Massachusetts weekend getaway? Uh, Massachusetts weekend getaway. Interesting. Um, I'm going to say uh, getting away out in the Berkshires, anywhere in the Berkshires. Um, I live in the city. It's very dense. And uh, it's nice to get away into the mountains and uh, have some open space. <laughs> Okay, Brent Barrow, favorite figure. Yeah, so I was a product of the 60s. So for me, it's John Kennedy. Okay, weekend getaway. My family is, is uh, deeply connected to the Cape. So for, for me, it is going down to the Cape. All right, Tanisha Sullivan, favorite figure. William Monroe Trotter. Okay, weekend getaway. Martha's Vineyard. All right, Eric Lesser, favorite figure. Uh, I'm gonna have to go with uh, Susan B. Anthony, All Politics is Local, native of Western Mass, or not not native, but spent a lot of time in Western Mass. And uh, for weekend getaway, I gotta go with Quabbin Reservoir. Okay, all right. Uh, well, <laughs> well, I thank all of you for joining us for this forum, this intentional big picture forum. Um, and I'm sure that you have, uh, awakened a lot of people who joined us on this call to know what your roles are and the importance state government um, as you see it. Thank you so much. Thank Kelly, you. thank you. Thanks everybody. Thank you. Thank you.